First Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one, toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. Um, we're thankful, Lord, that you speak to us through your word. And that, Father, you have a way that you've organized the church, Lord, for the purpose of flourish, flourishing and growth, God, in ways that we may not even understand, but what we see, Lord, the beauty of the church and how it all comes together that you ordained, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because you are the head of the church. This is your church. We are your people. We follow you. And we're thankful for the word that we are able to understand more about who you are as we're following you together as flock of God. We are your people, God. So may you help us today as we um, look at these verses today. May you give me the words, God. May it be your spirit speaking through me. May it not be my words, but yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us the last few months, you know we've journeyed through first peter and we're finally at the end in chapter five and we've covered a lot of ground throughout these last few months tracking with peter as he cares for the church that's dispersed and scattered because they've suffered the persecution of their faith that has just been taking place all throughout that time and as they're navigating what it looks like to follow jesus in a society that despises them peter is giving instructions on how they are to live as they are enduring suffering he plays a key role of strengthening the church and reminding them of the hope they have and the inheritance that awaits for them in Christ Jesus. You see, the church didn't stop when persecution started. However, the church was a growing movement that needed the care in a pivotal time as these early Christians were still learning how to follow Jesus in a world where they are suffering and, and, and going through persecution. Suffering. It's been pretty much the key word throughout 1 Peter, right? Angel preached a few weeks ago, and he mentioned that suffering, the word came up 20 times in the five chapters of Peter. 20 times in five chapters. That's a lot of suffering, right? But even with the suffering, all the suffering the church experienced in their day, it did not excuse followers of Christ on the obligation to remain holy as he has called them even in their suffering. It still did not excuse them from submitting to governing authorities. It still did not excuse husbands and wives honoring each other. They're still called to abstain from sexual sin, drunkenness, and to be self-controlled and sober-minded. All of this ground was covered throughout First Peter. And if you're here and you've missed any of those messages, I challenge you to go back and watch them as you're seeing Peter instructing the church to encourage the church as they are struggling or suffering. Peter's letter serves as a reminder of how a follower of Christ should live in a fallen and broken world as they're enduring suffering. This letter is to offer an encouragement to the believers in light of their circumstances. Press forward. Keep going no matter what comes about. The question is, how is all this going to be carried out? I mean, Peter sending letters to the church is important, right? And we're still blessed by them today. We open up 1 Peter, we read it now, and we're, we're encouraged by that. And it's interesting enough that there's a lot of similarities between Peter's day and ours, isn't it? If we start looking at it, some similarities that we've experienced and that they're experiencing that, they're that, in, the, in that day. But how are we going to continue to move forward, who is going to lead the charge in caring for the church? And looking at these words of Peter and carrying them out, and also through the rest of Scripture, who's going to be the person or persons to lead? 
This is where we come to chapter 5, verse 1. He says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Pretty strong words to the elders, right? And, and let, me, let me say this because some may be here, you're new to the Bible, reading it for the first time, and you're thinking to yourself, elders, does that mean like old guy with white beard, right? Like we talk about a bunch of old people here? Maybe. But biblically speaking, an elder's interchangeable for bishop, overseer, or pastors. What we normally call an elder today is a pastor. It's the one who is a spiritual leader that has a calling to lead the church prim primarily through the teaching of God's word and shepherding the people of God through his word. It's a great responsibility, especially in a time of suffering where the church needs the noblest leaders to rise up and to take charge and to spiritually care for the church. That's why I don't think it's a coincidence that the first four chapters we have Peter instructing instructing, giving instructions of what we should do, how we should live out. But the last chapter he saves for the elders of the church. He says, elders, this is now your responsibility. It is your responsibility to carry this out and to lead the church. The elders are to protect and make sure that the church is not taken advantage of by false teachers or people who lead astray but that they would fulfill the calling on their lives to faithfully lead people to Jesus and through his word. It's a great responsibility. So I got to ask you, in these unprecedented times, right, where we see a lot of suffering that's going around in 2020 and that you may have experienced and we've seen the similarities of what they experienced back then, what should you be looking for in a pastor? What should you be looking for in a pastor? Have you ever even been asked that question? What, what should I be looking for in a pastor? And, and let me be clear here. What should you be looking for biblically in a pastor? All right? I want to be clear. I'm not saying that, you know, you look for the, the pastor that gives you the warm fuzzies, right? Oh, the, the cool guy. You know, he's charming. Nice little hair. You know, handsome. Makes me laugh. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about biblically, what should we be looking for in a pastor? And let me say this also, this is an important side note, that we come to a church and a lot of times we, we love the worship, you know, we love the family feel and the environment. Those are great things. But when you are coming to a church and committing to a church, you're committing under the leadership of that church. You're not only bringing yourself, but some of you are bringing your families under the leadership of that church. This, by any means, is not a haphazard decision. This is a very important decision when we're bringing our families and ourselves under the leadership of the church. And listen, being in South Florida, we've seen some share of bad pastors, haven't we? Many of us uh, uh, have been under, store, been under uh, pastors that have been very manipulative and controlling, that have been quite hard they twist scriptures in a way that made you feel guilty or condemned if you did this, if you didn't do that, didn't follow them. They may even take advantage of the circumstances for own personal gain. We see this a lot of times with the prosperity preachers, right? Sow your seed of $100, and if you sow that seed of $100, you'll get triple, double the amount. You get, you know, your, all your, your prayers that you've asked for, you will receive, and, and people are starting to listen to that and believing that. See, there's no doubt that there are bad pastors exist, and they're seething with their words. It's, and it's an unfortunate situation. Unfortunately, a lot of us, some of us have experienced even some of that church hurt, being under churches where we've experienced that. The issue is they're not going anywhere. There's going to be bad shepherds, bad pastors that are out there. That's why it's so important that we understand and we ask the question, what should I biblically be looking for? And a pastor. Well, today 
um, in our text, this is going to help us answer that question as we're going to look to a few things. But before we dive into these verses, let me say this. As one of the pastors here at Restoration, I know I can speak for Jeremy and Steve. Uh, we are humbled by the responsibility that God has called us to lead this church. We don't take this responsibility lightly by any means. And so when we come across verses like this, we humbly come to them and say, gosh, are we living our lives biblically based according to what is being said here? Are we following what the Lord is requiring us as leaders and pastors of the church? So we humbly check our own hearts and examine and examine them. And so we ask you as the church, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray that we would continue to fulfill the responsibility that God has given us to lead this church and lead this church well forever, however long God has us leading, that you would pray for us. And not only us, but that you would pray for future pastors that would arise from the church as well, that they too would continue to fulfill the responsibility that God has called them. Because we understand that the church needs pastors for generations upon generations to come long after we are here. So pray for us. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So, but with that in mind, the question is, what should we be looking for in a pastor? Well, I'm going to answer that question. We're going to answer that question by asking a few more questions. And the first question is, what is the role of a pastor? What's the role of a pastor? First off, I think Peter's quite clear that it's not pastor, but pastors, plural. Notice he doesn't say in verse 1, I exhort the elder among you, but the elders among you. He's speaking of plurality here. Multiple men who are leading and not just one guy in control. There's a team of pastors, team of elders that are leading. I mean, can you imagine in the early church, right, one guy being in control? How dangerous. I mean, especially during a time of suffering and vulnerability, false teachers and doctrines could have misled many because one man had all the power without any accountability at all. And during that time when there were all kinds of beliefs that were going around, are you kidding me? There were different gods, there were different philosophies, different movements, different ideas. Could have easily been taught by one guy because he didn't have the accountability and it all crept within the church. And it could have destroyed the flock, destroyed the church. It's not one guy. The leading of the church isn't dictated by a single voice. But multiple elders with diverse thoughts and perspectives, yet they are biblically unified together. There isn't no division amongst the elder team. There's unity within the team to care for the church. I had a friend one time tell me that uh, his, one of his pastors said, well, you know what? We don't want a bunch of pastors running around here. No, uh, uh, uh. We need to have one pastor. And it's like, no, 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 no. No, we need multiple pastors. We need other leaders to come about and to care for the church. We just don't want one guy in control. Plurality of elders just as wasn't for the early church. It's still for the church today. Pastors still need other pastors to come alongside of each other to faithfully lead and serve the church. Me, Steve, and Jeremy uh, now, and we're the elders here at Restoration. I love it because this isn't Steve's church. This isn't Danny's church. This isn't Jeremy's church. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And we have been given the responsibility and entrusted to care and to lead for it together. Not our church. That's why I love when the elders come together. We're checking in on our hearts, right? We're following up with each other. How are you doing? How's your marriage doing? How are your kids doing? What are you reading scripturally? What, what, where, where is your heart? What are the struggles you, you've been dealing with? Where do we land theologically here? How are we going to help the church understand this? And let me tell you, there are times where we, we fight fair, but we fight for the sake of the church, there's times where we, we go at it because we want the church to continue to thrive and grow. We want our, to see our people continuing to, to love Jesus and following him and serving him with all of their heart. And so we get together and we go at it for the sake of the church. I mean, our hearts need to be in the right order, to, in the right place to lead, right? 
That's what you expect of us. You wouldn't expect otherwise. You wouldn't expect that there would be hidden sin within our own hearts, right? Or things not checked. No, 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 no. You want faithful men to continue to lead and to care for the church. You don't want anything off base. That's why I have other men that are checking on me and I'm checking on them. And we're doing this together as we're serving the church. We're shepherding the church of God in that way. Which brings me to the, one of the roles of a pastor, which is to shepherd the flock, right? So look at verse 1 again. He says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Now, I love the language Peter uses here when he's talking about shepherding the flock, right? If you were a, she- a shepherd in those days, Uh, you completely understood the responsibility to tend to sheep. Sheep needed to be, they needed the constant attention. Needed constant attention. If other animals wandered off and get lost, they instinctively knew how to find their way back home. Not so with sheep. Uh, If sheep went into unfamiliar territory, they get lost and they don't know where they are at. That's why I love the parable of Luke 15, 3 through 7. It talks about the parable of the lost sheep. Sheep needed a shepherd to guide them, provide for them, protect them, and sometimes also rescue them from harm. They're very passive animals and pretty much defenseless and against any predators. You ever heard the term killer sheep? No, me either, because it doesn't exist. <laughs> There's no such thing. The sheep need the protection from their shepherd to survive. Peter understood the imagery when he called the believers the flock of God and commands the pastors to shepherd them. Why? Because believers are prone to wander, aren't they? Believers can be influenced by the culture of those around them and be easily led astray. They can fall into temptation and if they're left alone, become defenseless to attacks, ravished by false theology and doctrine. Believers, just like sheep, are highly vulnerable if they're not cared for, and they can easily wander. We wander, don't we? I mean, think about it. Our, our, my, we never stay the course. Even throughout the day, our minds just wander. We're following. Everything is good. Then all of a sudden, left field. What happened? How did I get here? We're prone to wander. That's why Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We go astray. This is where the responsibility of a pastor is to shepherd the flock of God that that he's entrusted with and looking after the flock. That's the responsibility. It's the responsibility of the elders to make sure that people who are following Jesus keep following Jesus. Sometimes it means to have the hard conversations with people. Do we see that there is un- Uh, unhealthy pattern of sin within a person's life or there's unrepentance that is there it is the responsibility of the shepherds to say something of the pastors to say something and i get it sometimes people will say man but that's judgmental there's so many people that are they're condemning i I, you know when the pastors come and they get into people's business they shouldn't be doing that No, no 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 listen that's loving i say this church with all grace we see something that's off It's our responsibility to say something. That's loving. You know what's unloving? To say nothing. That's unloving. If I see something wrong, and I don't say anything. If I see, if a shepherd sees his sheep heading towards a ditch and doesn't do anything to prevent that from happening, that's a bad shepherd. We're bad shepherds if we don't see anything and we don't don't do anything what, what we see we've abdicated our responsibility. We've abandoned the post. We are responsible to help people follow Jesus in every area of their life. When you're struggling with sin, that we would come to you with grace and truth and remind you of who Jesus is and what he has done for you on that cross, that you would embrace that truth and give of yourself to him, knowing that you have a God who loves you and forgives you of that sin. And if we have to go over and over and over again telling you that wonderful truth, then that's the responsibility that we will uphold. We would tell you who Christ is and what he has done. 
elders are to shepherd the flock of God. And one of the ways they do that is also to, to provide oversight. Take a look at verse 2 again. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. I love that word Peter uses here, oversight. It means literally to look after, oversight, right? You think about a manager, right? They look over their team. They look at the reporting. They make sure that there's any deficiencies or something that's off. There are any gaps. They can call that out. They provide oversight of what they're looking at. Because wolves will try to attack the flock from the outside, right? Shepherds need to be on point. They need to be aware that the wolves don't come and attack from the outside. And not only from the outside, but from the inside, right? They may look like believers, but in reality, they're wolves. This is where you get the phrase, wolves in sheep clothing. The responsibility of the elders is to make sure that the wolves are not infiltrating the flock, flock of God with false teaching. They're on the prowl against that, that they're looking and they're aware of what's going on. I love how Paul says in Acts 20, 28, when speaking to the elders of the Ephesian church, he was about to leave this church. And if you follow the Apostle Paul's ministry, all he did was plant churches, plant churches, plant churches, and move on. And so he plants this church, and he's giving them these parting words to him as an encouragement. He says, pay careful attention to yourself. And to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Ooh. Wolves will come and attack with false teaching. And what's actually scary part is that they come from within the inside, right? You look at it, you see a wolf from the outside, or you see maybe somebody that's coming in that's a little bit, you know, you haven't seen them before. You know, you catch their attention, your attention is caught by them. But the scary part is the wolves that come within, that were walking with you, that were hand in hand with you. That's the scary part. So he says, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things inside and outside of the church. This is why the role of an elder is to shepherd the flock of God, provide oversight, but also to provide sound teaching and theology and to helping or sound doctrine and helping the church being fed spiritually within that way. Look at Titus 1.9. It says it like this. This is kind of speaking of the roles of of the pastors. Let me say this. There's other verses that we can point to looking at the responsibility of the elders. This is one verse, but there's many others. He, speaking of the overseer, the elder, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. An elder must be able to teach with sound doctrine. There are a lot of strange teachings that are out there, right? You catch some things, you're like, whoa, wait a second. I never heard that before. That's kind of weird. Wait a minute, right? You may even hear it from the outside. You also may hear it from the inside. People have different doctrinal positions. And listen, a lot of people have left churches because they may not agree with that position doctrinally. So they just, they leave because that that seems a little bit far off base. I remember um, years ago, we had a, a family that was coming to our church. Um, and they had uh, a doctrinal position of uh, baptism, salvation by baptism, meaning that you are saved if you get baptized. So if, if you accepted Christ as Savior, great. The next step is to get baptized. If you don't get baptized, then you don't go to heaven. Like, you need to get baptized. First time that I ever heard that before. I'd never heard that. And they were sincere. They were really wrestling with that, right? But the thing is, they held on to one verse that shaped their entire theology. Listen, theology is important. Let me, let me say this, right? Your theology shapes your view of God. You've got a good theology, you've got a good view of God. You've got a bad theology, you've got a bad view of God. And again, not divisive any way, loving family, they were just struggling with this. We had to, we were helping them to understand that faith is through Christ and Christ alone, not based off of works, right? If they are leaning on baptism to save them, 
then they're relying on their own efforts to be made right with God. And if we look throughout the whole New Testament, we see that salvation comes by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, not what you can do for him by going and getting baptized. It was an, it was an incredible moment, I'll be honest with you. This is the fun part about being, being in, in those positions uh, of leading that way and having that, those conversations. We wrestled with them, and it was an eye-opening experience for them. It was great for us because we had the opportunity to point this family back to the truth and hope of the gospel, speaking clarity to them in that way, and for them to embrace that and to be freed from deceptive theology. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. That's one of the roles of the elders, to be biblically sound, to point people to Jesus, and to teach sound doctrine. We're not called to be scholars, right? <laughs> I mean, nice to have some scholars around. Well, I don't think we got any, but you know, that's not the requirement of an elder, though. It's not to be a scholar. Elders to shepherd the flock of God provide oversight and sound teaching with the right heart in helping people follow Jesus. That's the responsibility of an elder. Which brings me to my next point. What are, what are the motivations of a pastor? What are the motivations of a pastor, right? We know what the, the role is, but what is the motivation? A pastor can have the right theology, have gospel clarity, can teach very well. But do they have the right motivations? And what are the right motivations? Take a look at verse 2 again. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. As God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those you're in charge, but being examples to the flock. Whole lot there, right? A whole lot there. But I love this because Peter is giving stark contrast between right motivations versus wrong motivations, right? An elder should not do this, but you should do this, right? And he kicks this off by saying an elder's motivation should be under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. What does that mean? Right? Under compulsion, but willingly. What does that mean? I mean, the easiest way to explain this is I have to versus I get to. I have to versus I get to. If it's a pastor who has a compulsive motivation, then they're kind of leading to that place of I have to, which can lead to many different directions, one being laziness. Gosh, I got to do this? And okay, you know, I got to be a pastor. I got to serve. Okay, uh, meetings. Yeah, caring people. Okay. So what, what, does that, what does that breed? Laziness. I got to tend to the flock. I got to. Gosh, I got to. Different when you're willingly. Because willingly is I get to. I get to have that opportunity to serve the church and to lead the flock. They find the responsibility to lead and shepherd the flock with great delight and great joy. And listen, the joy and the delight is not specifically found in the role itself, but their delight is in Christ above everything else. There's a deep satisfaction and a joy in who Jesus is and what he has done for them that gives them the right heart motivation to lead. And listen, they want others to know who Christ is. So there's this joy to go out and to serve the church and to lead other people and to care for other people because they enjoy their Savior first before they enjoy anything else. It's the right heart motivation to lead. Nothing else matters after that. If you have the right heart motivation in that way, who cares? At that point, nothing else matters. Certainly money is not a, a motivating factor. Look at the rest of the verse. He says, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Shameful gain is beyond just seeking wealth, but it's also shameful acquisition of it. A true shepherd will not use ministry to steal the shepherd's me money or acquire it dishonestly like false shepherds do. Right? The fact that Peter had to mention this was a reality of what they experienced then is what we kind of experience today. That there are people that are motivated by money. And to be in ministry, and as I did mention this a little bit earlier, we see this with the prosperity preachers, right? And that false theology where they twist the scriptures for their own profit or their own gain. Many ministries like that take advantage of the poor, the sick, the under-resourced, 
Sow your seed of $100. If you sow your seed of $100, then you could expect that you would receive health, money, wealth, all these things that you would receive. But listen, you've got to wrap your faith around that gift because if you don't have any faith well it doesn't happen and when they don't have it well you know what happened you didn't have enough faith wow the whole time they're sitting up there on top of the scheme see money should not be the motivation of a pastor if it is then the pastor needs to find another job let me say this being a pastor doesn't mean that you necessarily have to work for the church anyway there's some paid staff elders and there's some that are not Uh, jeremy and i are not on the uh, payroll of restoration, just being transparent. We are what you call lay elders. We love to serve the church with our gifts from macro level. That's not to toot our own horn in any way, shape, or form. We just love the church. We love God. We love his people. And we want to serve him with the gifts that God has given us. We love it. We enjoy it. And we hope other men will do the same. That other people would take up, stand up and say, you know what? I want to serve the church in this way. We want other men to rise up. Is it wrong to be a paid pastor of the church? Absolutely not. We need more paid pastors as well. We, we, you know, we need others that would step into those roles because there's needed for the church to continue to flourish and grow. But we also want other men who are saying, you know what? I want to serve the church with my, my gifts the way that I am right now. I don't need anything else, but I just want to serve. We need more men that would be willing to step up and to take on that responsibility of shepherding the flock with those intentions. Which leads me to the um, third motivation, which Peter says is not domineering over those in charge, but being examples to the flock. Not domineering, but being examples to the flock. The word in the ESV is domineering. Other versions say to lord over, right? To lord over. It's essentially to have a leader who's oppressive, dominating, or an intimidating leadership. Someone who is not gentle but forceful with their leadership approach. You know anybody like that? Now some of you are saying, yeah, you should, should be met, you should meet my boss, right? That's not what you expect from a shepherd, right? I mean, picture a shepherd to a sheep, right? A shepherd to a sheep is patient. The sheep wanders off, getting themselves in all sorts of trouble. The shepherd isn't going there abusively attacking the sheep, but he's patient with the sheep. Brings it back to the fold. When he does it, he does it over again. He's continuing to care, lead them to where food is, loving, caring. That's when you envision a sheep, you think of it, a shepherd, you think of that, that's how they should act towards a sheep. I mean, what's the culture look like when a domineering leader is in charge? What's the culture? Some of you come out of situations like that, verbally abusive uh, people that are leaders that have just said things and you think well you know what they're the leader they're in charge so we've got to listen to them god ordained them to be in these positions and so since god ordained them to be in these positions we should listen to exactly what they're saying no 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 listen that's not the the right way of a shepherd a shepherd isn't supposed to be domineering in any way look at what jesus says to some of his disciples when they wanted glory this is in matthew 20 25 through 28 it says, but Jesus called to them and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lowered it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, we're all called to be servants. All are. Especially, you see, pastors, we're not to be served, but we are to serve. Even Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. That's why I love the second part of the verse. Not domineering over those in charge, but being examples to the flock. Their responsibility is to be an example first, which is to show a servant-like attitude towards the flock. That's the responsibility. And listen, being examples of the flock could be easily misunderstood. Some can take this verse and interpret it to mean that the pastor has to show face. Pastors, you're the pastor, so you've got to, you know, tighten up. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? You better not show that you're weak. No, you're the pastor. You've got to lead the charge. If you've got some struggle going on, you've got a lot of issues that are going on, you know, brush it off. Keep on going. Listen. Pastors are bad heroes if you're expecting them to be. I say that with all love. They're bad bad heroes. Can't expect them to be like that. 
They'll fail you every time. This is why I love it. I, I love when I'm, when I'm raising my kids, when I, we're, we are raising our kids, right? We love our kids. We want to care for them, provide for them, shepherd them. We're, that's the responsibility that I have for my children, to so make sure that I'm providing for them and caring for them in that way. But I want nothing more than for them to know that when I make a mistake, that I need Jesus as much as they do. When I fail, I'm not going to cover it up and say, it's okay, let's keep moving forward. No, but that I would humbly come before them and saying, here's where I made the mistake. And just like when you make a mistake and I make a mistake, we all need to run to Jesus because he's the hero of the story. He's the savior. I am not the savior. <laughs> if you're expecting me to be a savior, I'm the bad savior. It's a responsibility that we would lead in that way so that people can continue to be, uh, their hearts be overwhelmed by that grace and truth. Not that you would look at us and think, man, they're, they got it together, right? They, they, understood, they understand, they're, they're the ones that, that got it all in line. They're in shape. No, 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 no. We need the chief shepherd, just like you need the chief shepherd. We turn to Jesus. He's the one that laid down his life as a payment for our sins. We look to him. With that said, it brings my last point. Then, then how, should we, how should we relate? How should you relate to your pastor, right? We pointed to Jesus. Yes, he's the chief shepherd, but how is that? How should this happen amongst each other? A few things as we close. First, for you young folks out there, be subject to your elders. Take a look at verse 5. He says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Uh, we don't know why Peter is specifically calling out the younger crowd to submit to the elders, but one thought would be that when you're young, you kind of tend to know things or think you know things, right? I remember when I was younger, I thought I had it all together. Can't tell me what to do with anything, Pastor. I'm 20. <laughs> Got it all figured out. What you're doing is wrong. You need to do like this. Grown. <laughs> then you start getting older, you realize that you don't actually know nothing. Right? <laughs> oh, wait a second. I don't know nothing as uh, you start getting older. So when Peter says the younger folks be subject to the elders, he means to submit. Submit. Now, he isn't saying to be quiet. Right? He's just saying be quiet. Just because you're younger doesn't mean that to stay quiet amongst the elders. Young people certainly have a voice, and they bring a lot of energy and enthusiasm that is needed in the church so that the church can continue to thrive and flourish with the young folks, the young people, right? But there is a level of humility that is expected from them to submitting to the authority of the elders. And I love this because he's pointing to all of us having humility towards, humility towards one another. All of us. Not just the young people, look at the rest of the verse. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I love the words clothe yourself. Peter used similar language in chapter 2. Putting on humility is like putting on a shirt. You put a shirt on every day, don't you? Every day, right? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> that would be awkward. But we put it on. We put on a shirt. In the same way, we should put on humility every day, and especially when we're engaging with the church, that that should be our posture. Can you imagine with me for a second if the church operated in that way, that we all operated from a place of humility? What would the church look like if everyone came with a place of operating in humility towards one another? That means when I make a mistake or somebody makes a mistake, that that person would humbly receive criticism or feedback and that they would humbly uh, ask for forgiveness, right? There would be forgiveness and reconciliation because of the humility with one another that is taking place within the church. That for the elders that we would show humility, let me tell you something, we're not always going to get it right. Elders of the church are not always going to get it right. We are going to make mistakes. That's why we need you with humility to approach us and to say, hey, I saw something that I don't agree with. 
we think that this needs to be like this, whatever it is. And it's our responsibility to humili- with humility to receive those words. I mean, can you imagine what that looks like? The contrary is to be divisive. The contrary is to say, man, you know what? The elders are not doing right. And start talking with other people. I I think they're doing it wrong. And all of a sudden, and we've seen this happen in churches where there is now a campaign against the elders or against the church. There's the vision. It's split amongst the church. Peter is calling us to live with humility with one another. The beauty of that would take place when the church comes together. That's what biblical community looks like when we come that way. Church, we need you. Let me say this. Um, We are... We need you. This isn't a top-down leadership by any stretch of the imagination. It's not us versus you, you versus no. The church operates together as one body. That's what we know of the church. It is a body that looks to the chief shepherd. The one that we look to is Jesus Christ first before anybody else. And so we need you. And as I did mention earlier, we need you to pray for us that we lead well, um, and that we also, we, we ask that you would pray for other leaders to arise from the church that are willing to serve and to lead with their gifts, their talents, their abilities, um, and to shepherd the flock of God. This is what the church is to look like, the beauty of the church. Let's pray together. God, we, we thank you We thank you because you're the chief shepherd, Jesus. (laughs) You're the chief shepherd. We we are not the ones. It's not about us by any stretch of the imagination. It is is not about us. It's not about the, the, the pastors. It's not about the church members. It's not about the congregation. It's all about you, Jesus. We look and and lean on to you, Lord Jesus. And we pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, in our weaknesses to look to you, Lord. But we also understand that you've ordained the church to look the way that it is with those under shepherds that you've put in place, God. I pray that you would help us to lead well, that you would help us to lead well, that, God, you would give us the strength to do that very well, and that you would help the church, Lord, to continue to live in humility with one another as it continues to flourish, Lord Jesus. We pray for other leaders to arise, Lord. We pray that your hand may continue to move, Lord, in the hearts of those who want to lead in that way, Lord. Thank you, God, because we know this is your church. We love you, Lord. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.